Well, class two has gone flying by, and uh, here's some things I'd just like to discuss. Uh, first of all, uh, we've made some mistakes in the answers to the activities. Sorry about that. We've corrected them. Secondly, a general point. Uh, some people have been asking questions, uh, things like, for example, huge data sets. How big a data set can Weka deal with? And the answer is pretty big, actually. But it depends on what you do, and it's a fairly complicated question to discuss. If it's not big enough, there are ways of, uh, of improving things. Anyway, issues like that should really be discussed on the uh, Weka mailing list, or you should look in the Weka FAQ, where there's quite a lot of discussion on this uh, particular issue. And the Weka API, uh, when you're a programming interface to Weka, you can incorporate the Weka routines in your program, and uh, it's wonderful stuff but it's not covered in this MOOC, so the right place to discuss those kind of issues are on the Weka mailing list. And finally, uh, personal emails to me. You know there's 5,000 people on this MOOC, and I can't cope with personal emails, so please send them to the mailing list and uh, not emails to me personally. Okay, I'd like to discuss the issue of numeric precision in Weka. Weka prints uh, percentages to four decimal places, most numbers to four decimal places, and that's uh, misleadingly high accuracy. Don't take these at face value. So, for example, here we've done an experiment using a percentage split, a 40% percentage split, and we get 92.3333% accuracy printed out. Well, that's the exact right answer to the wrong question. I mean, we're not interested in the performance on this particular test set. What we're interested in is how Weka will do in general on data from this source. And uh, we certainly can't infer that that's uh, this percentage to four decimal place accuracy. So in class two, we're trying to kind of sensitize you to the fact that these figures aren't to be taken at face value. For example, there we are with a 40% split if we do a 30% split, we get not 92.3333, but 92.381. You know, the difference between these two numbers is completely insignificant. You shouldn't be saying this is better than the other number. They're both the same, really, within the amount of statistical fuzz that's involved in the experiment. So we're kind of trying to train you to put your answers in to perhaps rounds to the nearest percentage point, or perhaps one decimal place. Those are the answers that are being accepted as correct. And uh, the reason we're doing that is to try and train you to sort of think about these numbers and think about what they really represent, rather than just copying and pasting whatever Weka prints out. These numbers need to be interpreted. Uh, so for example, in uh, activity 2.6, in uh, question two, the uh, four-digit answer would be 0.7354, and uh, 0.7 and 0.74 are the only accepted answers. And in question five, the four decimal place accuracy is 1.7256%, and we would accept 1.73, 1.7, and 2%. So we're a bit selective in what we, what we accept here. I just want to move on to the user classifier now. Uh, some people, some people got some confusing results uh, because they created splits that involve the class attribute. When you're dealing with a test set, you don't know the class attribute. That's what you're trying to find out. So it doesn't make sense to create splits in the decision tree that involve testing the class attribute. If you do that, you're going to get zero accuracy on uh, test data because the class, the class value cannot be evaluated on the, on the test data, the class attribute. So that was the cause of that confusion. Uh, here's a league table uh, for the user classifier. J48 gets 96.2 just as a reference point. Magna did really well, got very close to that, 93.9%. Uh, it took her uh, six and a half to seven minutes uh, according to the script that she that she, uh, that she mailed in. 
Uh, Miles did pretty well, 93.5. Uh, in the class, I got 78% uh, in just a few seconds. So I think anyone, any, if you get over 90%, you're doing pretty well on this data set for the user classifier. Anyway, the point is not really to get a good result. It's to kind of think about the process of classification. Okay, let's move to activity 2.2, partitioning data sets for training and testing. Question one asks you to evaluate uh, J48 with a percentage split using 10% for the training set, 20%, 40%, 60%, and 80%. And what you observed is that the uh, accuracy increases as we go through that set of numbers. Performance always increases for those numbers. It doesn't always increase in general. In general, you would expect an increasing trend, more training data, better the performance, asymptoting off to, at some point. But you would expect some fluctuation, so sometimes you'd expect it to go down and up again. But in this case, in this particular case, performance always increases. Uh, you were asked to estimate J48's true accuracy on the segment challenge data set in question four. Well, a true accuracy, what do we mean by the true accuracy? I guess maybe it's not really well defined, but what one thinks of is you, if you had a large enough training set, uh, the performance of J48 is going to increase up to some kind of point, and what would that point be? And actually, if you, uh, if, you, if you actually do this, well, in fact, you've done it, and uh, you find that between 60% uh, training sets and 97-98% uh, training sets using the percentage split option consistently yield correctly classified entrances in the range 94 to 97%. So 95% is probably the best fit uh, from this uh, possible selection of numbers. And it's true, by the way, that greater weight is normally given to the training portion of the split. So usually when we use percentage split, we would use two-thirds or maybe three-quarters or maybe 90% for the uh, training data and a smaller amount for the test data. Questions six and seven uh, were confusing and uh, we've changed those. The issue there was uh, how a classifier's performance, and secondly, the reliability of the estimate of the classifier's performance is expected to increase as the volume of the training data increases. Or how uh, they change with the size of the data set. So the performance is expected to increase as the volume of training data increases. And the reliability of the estimate is also expected to increase as the volume of test data increases. But with a percentage split option, there's a trade-off between the amount of test data and the amount of training data. That's what that question is trying to get at. Activity 2.3, question 5. How do the mean and standard deviation uh, estimates depend on the number of samples? Well. The answer really is that, roughly speaking, both stay the same. Let me find uh, 2.3 activity, question 5. As you increase the number of samples, you expect to get a, uh, you expect the estimated mean to converge to the true value of the mean and the estimated standard deviation to converge to the true standard deviation. So they would both stay about the same. This is in fact now marked as correct. Uh, actually, um, because of the n minus 1 on the bottom in the denominator of the formula for variance, it's true that the standard deviation decreases a tiny little bit, but it's a very small effect. So we've also accepted that answer as correct. So that's how the mean and standard deviation estimates depend on the number of samples. Perhaps a more important question is how the reliability of the mean uh, would, uh, would change. What decreases is the standard error of the estimate of the mean, which is the standard deviation of the theoretical distribution of a large population of such estimates. So the estimate of the mean is 
you get a better, more reliable estimate with a larger uh, training set size. Okay, the supermarket data set is weird. Uh, yes, it is weird. It's kind of uh, intended to be weird. Um, actually, the supermarket data set, uh, each instance represents a supermarket trolley. And instead of putting a zero for every item you don't buy, of course, when we go to the supermarket, we don't buy most of the items in the supermarket. Uh, the ARF uh, file codes that as a question mark, which stands for missing value. We're going to discuss missing values in chapter in class five. This data set is suitable for association rule learning, which we're not doing in this course. Uh, and the message I'm trying to emphasize here is that you need to understand what you're doing, not just process data sets blindly. Yes, it is weird. There's been some discussion uh, on the mailing list about uh, the extra model, cross-validation and the extra model. So when you do cross-validation, you're trying to do two things really. You're trying to get an estimate of the expected accuracy of the, classific of the classifier and you're trying to actually produce a really good classifier. So to produce a really good classifier to use in the future, you want to use the entire training set to train up the classifier. To get an estimate of its accuracy, however, you can't do that unless you have an independent test set. So uh, that's where cross-validation takes 90% uh, for the training and 10% for testing and repeats that 10 times and averages the result to get an estimate. Once you've got the estimate, then if you want an actual classifier to use, then you want a classifier, the best classifier, is one built on the full training set. And the same is true with the percentage split option. Uh, Weka will evaluate the percentage split, but then it will print the classifier that it produces from the entire training set to give you a classifier to use on your problem in the future. There's been a little bit of discussion of uh, advanced stuff. Uh, I think maybe a follow-up course might be a good idea here. So I noticed that if you apply a filter to the training set, you need to apply exactly the same filter to the test set, which is sometimes a bit difficult to do, particularly if the training sets and test sets are produced by cross-validation. And there's a, an advanced classifier called the filtered classifier, which addresses that problem. In uh, his response to a question on the supermarket data set, Peter mentioned unbalanced data sets and the cost of different kinds of error. And this is something that Weka can take into account with a cost-sensitive evaluation. And there is a classifier called the cost-sensitive classifier that allows you to do that. And uh, finally, someone just, a just asked a question on attribute selection. How do you select a good su subset of attributes? Excellent question. And there's a whole attribute selection panel which we're not able to talk about in this MOOC. This is just an introductory MOOC on Weka. Maybe we'll come up with a, an advanced uh, follow-up MOOC that is able to discuss some of these more advanced issues. OK, that's it. I just want to finish with a picture that uh, uh, someone sent in of two Wekas in an enclosure. It's rare to see Wekas in the wild. I've seen them a couple of times myself, but not very often. Uh, more likely to see a weka, you need to go to a, a bird uh, place where they keep, they've captured wekas for you to look at. And here are two wekas that Leah from Vancouver sent in. Okay, that's it. Now class three is up and uh, off you go with class three and uh, good luck. We'll talk to you later. Bye for now.